The corticosteroids appear to remember one of the major side effects is osteoporosis, problems with the mineralization of the bone, and that's where uh, this is another condition where you need to use calcium supplements. So the first one is hypercalcemia, dietary, hypoparathyroidism, absent or ineffective vitamin D, which could be related to uh, dietary conditions, some exposure or to chronic kidney disease, and other condition is the risk of osteoporosis, where you have uh, that in osteoporosis and glucocorticoid type. Um, now, if you go through the prescription list for a lot of other patients here, in Georgia, for example, um, you will find it surprising that a lot of these patients, particularly women, are on calcium supplements. Okay? Now, I always thought that, yeah, calcium supplements is an easy topic, so why, why to care and study it in detail? But what I found is that a lot of patients take it, and there's a lot of details about it, a lot of types of calcium supplements. So what I decided to do here today, to give a new approach to how to deal with this problem, since this is a common knowledge, I decided to go through a very nice and interesting interview with a guy called uh, Professor uh, Otsis. He's an MD and he's the head of the orthopedics uh, center at the uh, Rochester Medical Center. Okay? I found a lot of interesting information in a very simple language, so it's for the public uh, to read and understand. Lots of these questions are um, easy to understand and you have to apply in your practice. The first one is how much? How much should you now we discussed the, the conditions where we need to use cancer. But how much? Now he said something interesting that the body can only absorb about 500 milligrams at one time. Now I went to the uh, FDA uh, web page and they say that most commonly the requirements of the body are between 1000 milligram and 1.5 thousand milligrams. So one way to deal with that is give the patient the 1,000 uh, milligrams at once, early in the morning. Is that okay? Is that a good practice? And I found that my mom takes uh, cancer in this way. She just takes one uh, pen in the day and call it the day. Now he says, no, this is a wrong practice. Why? Because the absorption of cancer is so... Uh, um, uh, it's so sad. It means that it has a certain percentage that you can absorb at one time, and that's it. You cannot do anything more. So that's why the clinical practice, the right clinical practice, and tell your moms, if your moms are on calcium supplements, you can only use 500 milligram pill uh, at once, and if you need more than that, you have to split the dose into two or three servings per day. Okay? Now, the other thing which is important as a practical point is that calcium should be given with a meal. Okay? Why is that? First off, that we need the uh, stomach acidity to dissolve the pill, okay, to get the calcium. And the other thing is that the absorption of calcium is much enhanced when it's taken with food. Okay? So the prior practice is to prescribe calcium with a meal. Now, another interesting thing is that the foods that contain calcium could be sufficient that you do not need to give calcium supplements. Um, and this is something I did not know. I thought, no, calcium supplements are much better than giving the right foods that contain calcium. What he said, no, they are actually equivalent. The calcium that's in the food is equivalent to the calcium that we are uh, supplying in our pills. So what's better? Just modify the uh, um, uh, food regimens or the food types to contain more uh, calcium containing foods. Okay, now, what type? If you go through the drug list that has calcium in their names, you will find a lot of types. You will find something called calcium carbonate, calcium sulfate, calcium gluconate, calcium lactate. And you might also have the calcium carbonate plus vitamin D. They're all available in the market. So that's 
So what do you do? As a general practitioner, if you want to prescribe cancer, what do you do? What do you choose? Last one. Last one.
that you might experience concentration after using calcium carbonate. Okay, any questions about calcium itself? Yes? Uh, if someone took uh, 1500 milligrams of calcium at once, yes. would he not be side effects? Um, he will be more prone, but keep in mind that taking calcium, almost 80% of the calcium you are taking will not be absorbed. This is a fact. Okay? So even if you give a higher dose, the percentage will not be that much, but it could be in certain conditions, uh, lead to, it could lead to side effects. So people who are prone to have hypercalcemia. For example, if they have um, chronic kidney disease, okay? Vitamin D intoxication. Such conditions might give the patient or make the patient more prone to have a Continue. Okay, and uh, if, uh, we, uh, we only absorb 500 milligrams at once. Do we give them 500? Yes, exactly. So the formulations we have, for example, for calcium carbonate now, are 500 milligrams. Okay? Uh, such 500 milligrams will contain something of elemental calcium that he will be able to absorb, which is 20 to 30 percent in regular times. If you give it with food, that will increase the percentage. Mm -hmm. But you're still left with 80 percent, which will not be absorbed. Okay? So most of the formulations we have right, right now are 500 milligrams of calcium. You split it over time. How do you split it? If you decide that the patient needs 1,500, then split it into three doses and so on. So please communicate with your mouse today. They're taking it the wrong way. Yes. You have to answer that The calcium in the blood, is it mostly conjugated or free? 50% of free? Yes. So, there is only, let's say, that 98% of the calcium in your body will be located where? In the, in the bone. 2% will be circulating. Of the 2% circulating, there is 50% free, okay? And 50% bound. The 50% bound are 40% bound to proteins which are mostly albumin and pre and the other 50% are bound to what? Citrate and phosphate buffers. Okay? Now, when we measure the calcium concentration in the lab test, what do we measure? Free. The free uh, calcium, which is 50% of the 2%. Now, you have to go further. What's the fact that affects the parathyroid more? Is it the free in general or a subtype of the free? It's the subtype of the free that is ionized. So the free, the free, the 50% free are in equilibrium. Elemental, which is calcium, okay, they write calcium. And calcium plus 2, which is the ionized. The ionized ones are the ones that affect your parathyroid gland and your thyroid gland affecting the C follicular system. Got it? Okay, 98% are within the bone. We're not dealing with it. 2% are circulating, 50% of which are. Type. Vitamin D supplements, which is another also common topic that you could discuss with your parents today. Seriously, there are topics that are easy to be discussed in public. This one, this is one example. Type. Vitamin D supplements. Again, where do you need to use vitamin D supplements? Most of it is vitamin D deficient. Vitamin D deficient. What other conditions? What if I, if I measure your vitamin D levels and they're okay? It, so when there is an ineffective uh, vitamin D in your body, which means what? It's not metabolized in the kidney. It's in the form of... Uh, 
light hydroxys rather than the tri hydroxys vitamin D. Okay, so in effect, what else? Again, everything that I'm going to discuss today is going to be used in osteoporosis. So, so just come back and say osteoporosis. So another condition you might use vitamin D supplements is osteoporosis. All of these are related to the vitamin D, uh, whether it's absent or ineffective, reference to osteomalacia or whatever. Type. Now, the most commonly used drug in this group is calcium trigo. From its name, it's trigo, it means what? It has the trihydroxyl, okay? Or the three hydroxyl, which means what? Is it the active form or the inactive form of vitamin D? It's the active form. What advantage could you get if you give that the uh, active form of vitamin D? Exactly. So if you have a kidney disease, for example, that's not going to affect the drug in a way that it's active. It's already active. Okay? But it will affect it in another way. We'll just mention it. So the calcium, which is available in, in uh, our hospital, is the active form of the vitamin D, the 125, okay? Um, and it could be used in hypercalcemic conditions, particularly the ones related to absent or ineffective vitamin D, and it could also be used in osteoporosis, okay? Luckily enough, we have vitamin D supplements as orally, uh, oral tabs, okay? So they're gonna be easy uh, to be given to the patients. But in some cases where you need vitamin D at, in the spot, okay, we were also lucky enough to have such drug in an uh, IV injectable uh, formulation. Okay, there are conditions where you need to give vitamin D right away. Now, some important uh, practical points about vitamin D uh, supplements. One point your colleague just mentioned a few minutes ago. Now, if you are giving the vitamin D the active form, what's the major function? It will enhance calcium absorption from the intestine. That's the major effect. Okay? The major effect is to enhance the absorption. What if you have a problem with the absorption already? Like in malabsorption syndrome. Okay? The efficacy of vitamin D supplements will not be that great. Okay? And what we uh, uh, say in, in clinical terminology, the efficacy of vitamin D supplements are totally unpredictable in a patient who has, uh, like the, who has malabsorption syndrome. So you have to keep that in mind. The efficacy is not going to be that great. The um, other thing, okay, we said that the major clinical advantage of giving the active form is that in the kidney disease, it's okay. The effect will be the because it not, does not need any elimination. But the problem we are facing here is that most of the elimination of such drugs happens within the kidney. Okay? So you have to use caution if you are giving the vitamin D uh, in renal uh, failure patients or patients with renal diseases. The third important thing which is related to the function, vitamin D increases the absorption of calcium from the intestine. So what should we tell your patient to give? Don't. Totally opposite. You have to take enough calcium. Because the function is to increase the absorption. But what if you're not taking calcium? What if you're not eating uh, um, uh, calcium containing food? So it makes sense that you have to communicate with your patient the drug will be active only if you are taking enough calcium in your food, so it will enhance the absorption of calcium from the intestine. Again, these are the clinical problems we need here. Adequate dietary calcium is necessary for the clinical response. Efficacy is totally unpredictable in patients who have malabsorption syndrome. And please, you have to be cautious when using the drug in patients who have renal or hepatic impairment because the elimination process takes place in these cells.
you have a problem with the metabolism of the drug, then you will have a problem. Whether with the increased uh, dose at one time, which could lead to more side effects, or the elimination process will be better. Okay? Joy. <laughs> <laughs> yes.
the parathyroid hormone or the parathormone. But just a few facts about parathormone and how it functions because that's going to help us understand how we use it in practice. The first thing, if we are talking about the bone mineralization, we said that it's under the balance of the two functions. Bone formation, which is a function of osteoblast, and the bone resorption, which is a function of osteoblast. Now what you know is that parathyroid hormone is important in what? Bone resorption. It activates osteoblasts. But that's not totally true, not entirely true. Because parathyroid hormone could have effects or could activate the bone formation and could activate also the bone resorption. So how does it work? What defines that? What defines that are the amount and the time of exposure to parathyroid. What we know currently is that if this is the bone and you are giving the parathyroid hormone in very small and intermittent pulses of parathyroid exposure, that's going to lead to what? That's going to lead to bone formation. Okay? On the opposite uh, uh, picture, if you are giving the parathyroid in a much more sustained and large doses, much more sustained pattern and with large doses, what you're going to do is you will activate the bone resorption mechanism. Okay? And this explains what happens in hyperparathyroidism, right? Because the patients are constantly uh, exposed to very high levels of parathyroid hormone, so the dominant effect will be a bone resorption picture. Okay? So, how do we use that pharmacologically? Osteoporosis, why? Health. Exactly. That's what we did. If we understood this physiologic principle, then it's easy to develop a drug and give it in very small and intermittent pulses, so that will be in the uh, picture of bone formation uh, uh, with much less bone resorption, okay? But there's a problem, and it's shown here. When we looked at parathyroid hormone function over months, okay, we gave it the perfect way we, we said, which is give it in the very small and intermittent pulse. What happens is the problem is that we started having bone formation markers, at the same time we started having bone resorption markers. But notice that the bone formation markers are much higher and with much, uh, a much earlier time point than the bone resorption markers. Okay? So this is exactly what happens. When you give the parathyroid hormone even within the perfect scenario, which is the very small and intermittent pulses, you have to keep in mind that early on, you're going to have something called the anabolic window. The predominant effect is bone formation. But what happens later on is that you will have the plateau and the reduction in the bone formation and the resurgence of the bone resorption process and its marker. So you are limited to a period of time where the parathyroid hormone could be affected in bone formation. This is called the anabolic window. This highest level of bone formation with much less uh, uh, bone resorption markers happens particularly within the first 6 to 12 months. Could this be related to receptive functions, sensitivity, levels? We do not know exactly how that happened, but it's that happened. So this is what we have. We have a drug called teriparatide. Okay? Teriparatide is a recombinant uh, segment of the human parathyroid hormone. It's available in the market and it's given as a subcutaneous injection once a day with very small doses, which is about 20 micrograms. Okay? But the problem with that will be what? You have to use it only for a limited period of time, after which you will stop the bone resorption thing. And that's why it could be used for up to two years, after which you cannot use it anymore. Recent studies have showed something very important, and this is a US question. 
Terry Paratal, when it was given for a long time, particularly after two years, in rats, in, in animals, they found that there is an increased risk of osteo support. Okay? This was not particularly translated or found in human patients. But the FDA does not deal with possibilities. Okay? It deals with certainty. Because they found that there is a much higher increase in the risk of osteosarcoma after the use of teleparatide for more than two years, it's now a black box warning on teleparatide. You cannot use it uh, um, more than two years because there is an increased risk of osteosarcoma. Did you understand that? So this is the black box warning of teleparatide. Um, they did not know. They studied that, okay, uh, and they did clinical trials, but the thing is, it's a recent job. So, this is something they are trying to figure out. When can I use it for a second go? Okay, and they haven't decided that, but that's a good question. And it's studied currently in a clinical trial. The problem is the increased risk of osteosarcoma. Okay. Type. Uh, this is another uh, U.S. English. The only drug that could be given in osteoporosis to stimulate bone formation is teriparatide. Okay. What other kinds of drugs we have given already are the anti-resorptive agents. This phosphonates, for example. These are anti-resorptive, they work on the inhibition of the osteoblast function, okay, to inhibit bone resorption, but they do not have any effect on osteoblast, right? And that's why with this phosphonate you have something called net bone formation. It does not induce bone formation, but there is a net bone formation because there is an inhibition of osteoblast function. Now, teleparatide is the only drug that we have currently which could stimulate the bone formation by what I showed you already acting on that anabolic window. And this is an example of one of the recent trials. Uh, they used teriparatide. This is uh, one of the vertebrae. And you could see in the body, I don't know if you see that much, but there is less resorption and there is also uh, a lot of bone formation within that body. And this is the effect of teleparatide. So it's not uh, a lot of actual words. The other thing that they found is that when you give teleparatide, there was a reduction in the risk of vertebral and non-vertebral fractures, which are very common with patients who have osteoporosis. And this is very important. Now, we said that osteoporosis could have a high incidence in postmenopausal women. But with this uh, fact in, in our minds, teleparatide was also started to be using, used in men. Why? Particularly men who have an increased risk of vertebral fractures. You know, the elderly people who have a previous uh, fracture or whatever. People who have uh, neurological problems in their gait or whatever, and they could fall and have fractures. You could use teleparatide because there's a huge increase in the risk for fractures, 65% and 53%. Decrease. Decrease, sorry. Decrease in the risk of these fractures. Type. They are not the first line in osteoporosis. What's the first line? This is um, Why is that? Because we are more comfortable dealing with this phosphonase. Uh, we have a long history of dealing with that drug, so we know a lot about it. So that's the first line. This is a new drug. Uh, it's a lot more expensive and that's why it's not the first one. Type. Castone. Castone is not that particularly well understood as a hormone. You know that. Right? What do we know about the topic of castone? Decrease. Decrease more resorption. Okay. Uh, what about the intestine? Does it affect the intestinal uh, absorption of castone? 
Calcium myopathics are very small organic molecules. Okay? Their function is to come down and bind to this calcium sensing receptor and to do something, one thing, which is to increase the sensitivity of that receptor. What does that mean in simple words? It means, exactly, even the very low calcium concentrations within the blood will be sensed by this receptor to inhibit the secretion of uh, I could give you one analogy to that in its bison. So, yeah, take each one. This bison is an energy drain. Okay, it makes you more uh, um, receptive, right? It increases your sensitivity to the surroundings, makes you more awake. This is what the calcium myometrics do. They just increase the sensitivity of the resistance. That means two important things. That they do not compete with calcium core binding. Okay? That's not their function. They do not compete. They bind to a different place within the receptor. And the other thing is that they do not activate the receptor in the absence of calcium. If there is no calcium, there is no activation. Calcium has to be bound. But the difference is that the sensitivity to the level of the calcium within the extracellular fluid is much increased. Where can you use this? True, true value. Hyperparathyroidism. In the primary or in the secondary or in both? Primary. Primary. Oh, secondary. Okay. So, the major use of these drugs is actually in secondary hyperparathyroidism due to chronic renal disease. Okay? What do we mean by secondary hyperparathyroidism? There's a problem in the kidney, there's less vitamin D, there's less absorption of calcium, hypercalcemia, that will activate palatone, right? So to inhibit that, you can use sinacalcin, which is a calcium mimetic. The other way is to do what? How do you treat it when you have it? Not very much. Be a little bit humble. Give some calcium to but another thing in parathyroidism, what, what do you do? Have a problem. Just take the freaking event. Do surgery. Right? But sometimes surgery is not allowed. For a reason or another, there are contraindications to surgery. You decide, I cannot use uh, a surgical uh, parathyroid. In that case, senacalysis would be a good choice. It could be given as oral tabs. The important thing which we found is that there was a rapid reduction in the parathormone levels. And this makes it much better than giving the calcium supplements themselves. Because the calcium supplements themselves will take some time to act. But if you give the sinacalcin, they have a much more rapid response in reducing the PTH levels. The half-life is very long, 30 to 40 hours, so you do not, use it, you do not need to use it frequently. Okay, I'm done. Any questions? Yes? This is the carcinoma. No, 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 it does not increase carcinoma. It could be used in parathyroid carcinoma, which, would, which could lead to a to hypercarcinoma. Okay, so you could use it in that condition. Yes? Yes. Because you want to modify the process in which you could activate the building process. So that's why the best choice is to give calcium plus vitamin D. Okay? It will act on that particular pathway of bone formation. But at the same time, it could neutralize the effect of the bone resorption. Okay? There are certain conditions where we, we have hypercalcemia and we use calcium. How? If the hypercalcemia is secondary to something, for example, if it's related to secondary hyperparathyroidism, you have to use calcium to suppress the release of parathyroidism. Yes?